Well, uh, he's senior astrophysicist at Goddard and Goddard Fellow right now. And uh, he is senior project scientist about James Webb Space Telescope, the largest pro program in the world that you can imagine. Uh, and he'll tell you in a few minutes about that. Uh, Dr. Mather joined the Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, to head the Cosmic Background Explorer. It's called COBE, uh, as a mission uh, project scientist. And uh, he had been a, a Goddard Fellow since '94, and he's uh, currently a senior project scientist and a chair of uh, the science working group of the James Space Telescope mission. If you've ever been at Goddard, there is a huge, uh, a huge clean room of the size of a few of our buildings where the space telescope mirrors are sitting. So, uh, Dr. Mather has numerous awards, and it's the whole page. We just got a few of those, the most important. Uh, they include the John Lindsay Memorial Award, National Air and Space Museum Trophy, uh, AIA Space Science Award, Aviation Week and Space Technology Laureates for Space and Missile, uh, Danny uh, Hinman Prize for Astrophysics, Rumford Prize, Benjamin Franklin Medal in Physics, and membership in National Academy of Science. He had been elected to the American Astronomical Society Council. Uh, in 2006, Dr. Mather won the Nobel Prize for Physics, awarded by Royal Swedish Academy of Science. Uh, he shared the prize with uh, George F. Smoot of the University uh, of California for their collaborative work on understanding the Big Bang. Uh, well, um, the COBE program announced uh, that they had mapped the primordial hot and cold spots in the cosmic microwave background radiation. These spots are related to the gravitational field in the early universe, uh, only instants after the Big Bang, and are the seeds for the giant clusters of galaxies that stretch hundreds of millions of light years across the universe. The team also showed that the Big Bang radiation had a spectrum that agrees exactly with the theoretical prediction confirming the Big Bang theory and showing that Big Bang was complete in the first instance with only a tiny fraction of the energy released later. Oh, well, this is a short one. And uh, there, there was an interesting question that, that John asked uh, me and Joe Dutrimont, say, why did you guys invite me? I mean, what made you to invite me? Because usually, <coughs> I'm just saying your words, may? Yep. Okay. <laughs> that was a few minutes ago. Because usually uh, I speak in front of groups of the students or graduate students or conference, whatever. Why would the manufacturer invite you? I recalled years ago at NASA we had uh, the talk with Bloombergen, uh, the guy who is a Nobel Prize laureate who... He was 85 years old by that time, and he uh, opened the hepatitis B vaccination. And there was a very interesting question like that from audience that was asked to the guy. I said, what's happening? Why are the Nobel Prize laureate? And the guy had like super uh, good sense of humor. He said, listen, I wasn't... And he speaks with a Brooklyn accent, actually. He said, I was in Brooklyn High School. You know, there were three Nobel Prize laureates from that school. We must have something in water. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that whatever we have in water is the inspiration that uh, Joe brings to the company. And it spreads like good disease, <laughs> among others. And that brings people of that caliper like our speakers to our talk and I thank you very much to them for showing up with us and sharing their life which is their work and inspiring us even more for that. We're welcoming John Mather. Well, thank you very much for that uh, wonderful and warm introduction.
Uh, we're still having an interesting argument with the computer in the display. So um, I want to tell you today uh, lots of stories about the universe, uh, beginning at the beginning and going to the end, uh, and tell you some stories about how we uh, uh, have found out this uh, amazing history of the universe and what we hope to find out in the future. Um, I will tell you a little bit about the Cosmic Background Explorer satellite, which is the thing that earned me this little uh, gold pin that I have on my lapel, and, um, and tell you something about the work that uh, led to the announcement today of another Nobel Prize in Physics for cosmology. Uh, and I'll show you something about the new James Webb Space Telescope that we're building now to follow on after the Hubble Space Telescope. And so uh, I see we're making some progress. I hope. So uh, this is a, uh, oh, oh, that's much better. Adjusted yeah. to my mind. Yeah. Um, so this is a uh, thing that turned out to be um, quite an interesting challenge. Let me step over here so I'm not in the way of the screen. And uh, I think we're, well, anyway. Uh, so um, this is a mystery. <coughs> it's probably trouble with the on-off switch somewhere. Um, anyway, uh, to begin at the beginning, um, the universe has been expanding for a very long time. We now think it's 13.7 billion years long that it's been doing this. Uh, the way that we found out was uh, back in 1929, Edwin Hubble published a paper where he said, uh, we've seen the distant galaxies. We've measured about how far away they are. Uh, we've seen uh, also how to measure how fast away, fast they're going. And uh, some of them are, almost all of them are going away from us. This was the number one big surprise. Why are all the distant galaxies going away from us? Well, it was only a few years before that that they discovered that galaxies are made of stars. That the galaxies out there, the little fuzzy spot out there in Andromeda, which we call the Great Nebula in Andromeda, um, it's actually made out of tens of billions of stars. Nobody knew that until the early part of the 20th century. Uh, so um, then uh, Hubble and other people before him figured out how to see that there are some little stars that go blinking on and off in that great nebula in Andromeda. And suddenly he said, now I know how to measure how far away this thing is because we've got stars nearby that blink on and off too. So suppose they're alike. Then we can tell by the ratio of brightnesses how far away things are. So we know how far away it is to the, these nearby blinking stars. And we'll now say that we know how far away the distant galaxies are. So this was a huge, huge, huge step. Uh, before that, we had no clue that we, our own galaxy, the Milky Way, wasn't the only one in the universe. And suddenly we knew that there were tens of billions of them, and that they're far away, and that they're going away quite fast. Now, uh, Hubble drew a chart that showed uh, this remarkable trend plot that says um, the farther away, the faster. So farther away and faster, well, why don't we try calculating how long they've been doing this? Divide the distance by the speed. You get the age of the universe. So that was the, uh, the great discovery of 1929. Now, let me tell you another short story, uh, how this came to be thought about. In 1905, Albert Einstein told us that space and time are mixed together, that neither of them is absolute. And if you uh, want to know how he came to think about this, he was working in the patent office, and they were trying to synchronize clocks all over Europe so the trains would run on time. So he did all these thought experiments about how do you synchronize clocks, and it turned out that led him to the theory of relativity. And none of the people who were proposing patents had thought about this yet. Uh, but he thought about it, and he said, this is really fundamental. We use light to synchronize clocks. This means we have to, that's all there is to do. So uh, I'll think about this, and I write my theory of relativity in 1905. So big surprise, people didn't like it, uh, but you know it worked. Uh, in 1916, 15 and 16, he published a new version that said, well, not only are space and time mixed together uh, in this basic way, but there's something called general relativity that he's now invented, which says uh, gravitation operates by curving space and time. So um, uh, this is a totally astonishing uh, thought. So space and time are not just mixed together, they're curved. So in that, the, he now has the ability to uh, calculate what should be the gravitational effect on the universe as a whole. So in 1916, we hardly even knew that there was a universe. we just begun to discover that distant galaxies have stars in them. So this was a tremendous breakthrough of thought. So uh, nobody was expecting this. Um, and people still didn't like it. 
but it turned out to be true. Uh, it was about, what, 1919 that um, Eddington went off to measure the deflection of starlight. Am I remembering this right, John? Um, anyway, they went off to measure the deflection of starlight by the uh, gravitational force from the sun. So, uh, okay, confirmed the prediction of Einstein, which was uh, twice as much deflection as what uh, Isaac Newton's theory would have said. So maybe this is right. Maybe this weird theory that uh, gravitation operates by cur curving space and time is actually true. So, so far it seems to be. We've never found Einstein to be wrong yet about these subjects. People keep asking me, well, are you sure you can't go faster than the speed of light? I want to go faster. Um, I want to get to those stars quicker. Well, to tell you the truth, we've never found a way to do it. Uh, there isn't even a real hint anywhere. So once in a while you read that something goes faster than the speed of light, like a week ago, but it's probably not right. So um, I'm afraid we're still working on the uh, display question, but we'll tell you stories anyway. So, um, okay, so now I want to tell you the next step in this story. Um, so Einstein said, oh, okay, I can, uh, now I have equations that should apply to the gravitational field of the entire universe. Isaac Newton had encountered this question before, and he said, well, you know, if the universe is infinite, I can't calculate anything because I know how to do calculus, but all the numbers come out to be infinity. So it wouldn't work. He couldn't tell what to do. So Einstein said, well, I now have things we call differential equations, and you don't have to add up all those forces. Uh, and he said, we calculate curvature of space and time, so now I can tell you what equations should apply to the universe. And soon enough, uh, 1916 he gave us this, 1922, a uh, young fellow working in, um, I guess it was already um, Leningrad, all right, at that time, uh, he uh, said, well, I can apply these equations, and I say the universe is expanding. So, uh, this was Friedman. Uh, and then he went and died of the plague or something about three years later, so he didn't find out that he was right. Uh, in 1927, Georges Lemaitre, who was a, uh, a physicist, a mathematician, a scholar, and a... And a clergyman, a, a Jesuit scholar, I believe, in Belgium, he said, I can do this math, and he got the same answer Friedman had gotten, apparently independently, uh, and he tried to get it published, and Einstein said, well, that's crazy. Um, your mathematics is correct, but your physics is abominable. So anyway, he had a hard time getting it published. He published in a small journal in Belgium, and hardly anybody paid much attention. Uh, but he actually had the data to say the universe is expanding. He knew the, some of the distant galaxies. He was aware that you could calculate the age of the universe. And so we really should call it Lemaitre's Law, but everyone calls it Hubble's Law. So uh, uh, he got to tell this story. And uh, two years later, when Hubble's discovery was published, uh, a slightly more ambitious version of the similar thing, uh, suddenly everyone says, I salute, uh, it's obviously clear, the universe is expanding. Um, and this was front page news around the world. So Hubble was perhaps a little better at, at uh, getting public attention than Lemaitre was. Uh, but at any rate, now we have the expanding universe. So uh, people think today, well, it's just a, they call it the theory of the, of the uh, Big Bang. Well, to tell you the truth, uh, the data were a big surprise. It was uh, a theory. It came from Einstein and Lemaitre and Friedman in the early part of the 20th century. So now a century later, we still have people who don't like it. Uh, but it's uh, so w extremely well supported that it's amazing. So let me see. I have. Uh, I still will tell you some word pictures and word word stories. Um, so uh, going on from from the twenties, uh, we had a, a big war, and uh, we developed a lot of new technology. And um, after the war, uh, cosmologists came back to their work and said, "Well, I'm going to figure out what happened." So I. Uh, young uh, uh, scientist from Ukraine, uh, George Gamow, was working in Washington, D.C. at George Washington U. And he had a couple of very much younger colleagues, uh, Alpha and Herman, who were working with him. And they started off to calculate what should this Big Bang look like? What would you see now from that? So a couple of things they worked on. One is uh, how much helium and hydrogen should there be? And could there be any of the heavier elements uh, in the universe as a result of the Big Bang initial conditions? So they calculated about the right amount of uh, helium versus hydrogen, which turns out to be an almost universal constant. If you measure stars uh, throughout the universe, there's a sort of minimum amount of helium they all have. And this is as it would be if the Big Bang gave us the helium. So that's evidence number one in the 40s. Uh, 